Advanced Principles Podcast, or APP, was created to be an outlet for like-minded individuals to share in the broader conversations on leadership, retail market updates, and incredible personal success stories. On APP, you will hear a collection of stories from the titans of the retail industry, as well as thought and practice leaders covering the spectrum of the economy. Please click the subscribe button and look for the newest episodes to be released. You played for nearly a decade professionally, and I do want to spend just a little bit of time because I think you've, you, you certainly opened my eyes to it. I think your eyes got open to it, is what that transition is like for professional athletes to be civilians, you know, just working in the public sector, finding a job, finding their way through life, you know, working out weddings and daycare and elementary school and parent-teacher conferences. So just a little bit of what was that mental journey like when you when you officially decided to hang up the cleats, uh, the boots and uh, and take on, you know, what we would deem as normal life or real world life. I want to go back. I want to just go back to slide tackling people and just running outside for a couple hours a day. That was so much fun. (laughs) Um, I didn't retire on my own terms, which a lot of people don't do. I had some injuries, um, you know, some falling out with a club. So it was. I had three surgeries when I retired. It was just a combination of things, right? Um, you know, I, my identity was uh, firmly uh, implanted in soccer. I was Wells Thompson, the soccer player. Wherever I went, I was Wells Thompson, the soccer player. And one day I wasn't anymore. And the world looks at you a little bit differently um, being retired. It's like, what's for lunch? You know, like, mm-hmm. who cares sort of thing. And, um, you know, um, versus act, when you're playing, right? Everybody wants to talk to you and this sort of thing. The, the, the transition is still difficult. It's not nearly as difficult as it was. And um, as a matter of fact, I remember uh, I was working for you and, and we were at the Cleveland All-Star Game. And um, gosh, I can't remember his name right now, but he asked me, he said, do you miss it? And this was like five years, four years after I was done playing. And for the first time in my life, I said, I'm actually, you know, I'm living my dream because mm-hmm. this is my dream. Like my bigger dream is, uh, is my family and my kids. I've always wanted to be a dad. Um, but all I knew my whole life was soccer. Soccer gave me everything. It really did. And so that, um, you know, a part of the, the uh, journey for me is changing my mindset around soccer because when I retired, I wanted nothing to do with the game. I really wanted nothing to do with it. Um, I thought kind of kiddingly, like a press release would go out Wells Thompson retires, scroll across the bottom of the news stations. People would line up at my door and say, I want him for 150. I'll take him for 175. You know, I think that first year I coached a U9 team, my very first game, I coached, we got beat 17 to one. Oh. I was paid like 200 bucks a month. I was like, this sucks. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, just, you know, God, I think orchestrated it. I ended up connecting with you and you were like, Hey, I'm doing this and you want to do this. And I was like, Oh my God, that sounds amazing. No one's even come close to offering me that. I was like, sign me up. And so it's difficult for people. It's really difficult. I don't think that, um, Lindsay Vaughn says it's like a death that you always mourn. I do believe that. I think some people, um, transition better than others. I think that you, you can't take any of the transition away. Like you can't take all of the pain or the struggle of the transition away. There'll always be a struggle, a uh, constant in your life for 25, 30 years is, is yep. going to be hard to part with. Um, but I think that you can prepare to do things. And that's what I'm, that's what I want to share with people is like, cause it was the most asked question I got, what we do when you're done is like, I'm never, I'm never, forget rookie season. I'm like, can you just let me enjoy my season? Like, <laughs> what do you, it, it was good because it made me like, think about it, but I just wasn't proactive. And I was proactive. I did try things, uh, but I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was yeah. hard. Yeah. Very difficult journey, but I think it, it did lead you to a, another purpose, which is, you know, helping others make the transition and dealing with it. So, um, you know, and now let's talk about really what you've gotten into and how that all played a role in it. So talk a little bit about your current role, your current company, um, what your mission is out there to do it. And then we'll start to unpack that because I think that backstory from everything from, you know, a troubled or misguided youth that was immensely talented, but maybe wasn't capitalized on the potential to, 
you know, the, the underdog, the work ethic, the true grit to get to where you have been, kind of the, um, the success and the adversity that you experienced in the professional lengths, I think all packaged up led you to where you are today to deliver the message that you're delivering. So spend a little bit of time uh, talking about exactly what you're doing today. Yeah, well, so what you said just um, is my life, right? It's it's the the hard things, the crappy things, the painful things actually end up being the good things. They teach you things, right? Like I think about what I learned raising the MLS Cup. It wasn't much, uh, but I think about what I learned, like retiring and having three surgeries and not knowing who the hell I am. Like that freaking learned a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so I started a company, uh, called soccer resilience with a guy named Dr. Brad Miller. And so we really, really focus on the mental aspect of sport. Uh, we help players, parents, coaches, even referees train the most underutilized competitive edge in sport. And that's your mind. Mm. Right. And so looking back on my career, hindsight being 2020, um, I really struggled as a pro because of my thought life. Um, and I didn't do anything. I, it's not fair to say I didn't do anything, but I didn't like, I didn't see a sports psychologist. That's a lie. I saw a sports psychologist once, um, because the coach in Colorado, Gary Smith, uh, he had a relationship with sports psychologist in Denver and we all got one free session. So I went, I loved it. You know, I didn't go back cause I had to pay for it. Mm. What an idiot. Like, this is your career. You should invest in this. You know what I mean? So like, that's my biggest regret in my career is I wish I could go back mm. and, and focus on the mental aspect of sport. I mean, you have it like people find this shocking, but MLS teams don't have sports psychologists on staff. Don't have anybody that accounts for. I, so this is a question and I know it was in your sheets, but what Ryan, what percentage of sport and life do you think stems from the mind? No right or wrong answer, but what do you uh... think? I, knowing what I know, I'll probably put a pretty high percentage on it, but I would probably say 70, 80% of success is, is more mental than physical. Yeah, no doubt about it. And so I, I look back on my career as a youth, my greatest asset was my mindset. I was going to fight. It didn't matter who you were. I was going to believe in myself. I was going to, you know, work really hard, but as a pro, I believe my greatest asset became my greatest detriment. I was a basket case. And so one of your questions was, what's life as a pro? To me, the first thing that comes to mind, it was a mind F. Mm -hmm. It was a mind bleep. Like it was just because you're constantly, you can't settle. You're constantly fighting every single day. Your job is on the line and you have to go out and compete. And so, um, you know, obviously the, the higher you rise in the game, the differences, the differences in talent, like everyone's fit as a pro, everyone's strong, everyone's fast. So the difference to me comes down to your thought life. And my thought life was so jacked up, man. I wish I could go back and change it. I'll give you an example. I was so embarrassed when I didn't start. Embarrassed. Like I, I didn't want my parents to know. I might've been on ESPN. I didn't want my, my friends to watch because then they call me and be like, Wells, why aren't you starting? And I'd be like, the coach is an idiot. I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. And like, I'd literally sit on the bench being like, oh my God, I suck why aren't I starting? I'm like, nobody should tell themselves that in the first place, but mm -hmm. especially not someone who's a pro athlete. And so, um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in what the, one of the, we all tell a story and the greatest story we tell is the one we tell ourselves. And so it's still a constant battle for me. It's something that I'm working on. So soccer resilience for me, for Dr. Brad Miller, Dr. Brad played away struggle with performance anxiety is a clinical psychologist. He's really the original founder of soccer resilience. Um, we're turning our pain into purpose. Like we wish we had more of this. And as a pro Ryan, we had a nutritionist, we had uh, masseuses, we had physical therapists, we had needlers, we had cuppers, we had ice bath specialists. We didn't have someone who you said accounts for 75, 80% of performance in life. Wow. And so just, you know, the, me, my evolution as a man, um, I got an ultra running when I, when I retired, having kids, I'm like, yeah, it's all freaking mental, man. It mm -hmm. is all mental. So I wish I could go back and train that. And, um, you know, the, the pandemic's brought that to light and, and, and we're in a good position now in terms of timing. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at that, you, you know, I, I look back on some of the athletes and they used to do endorsements for cigarettes or tobacco companies. And there was, you yeah. know, famously there were athletes smoking and dugouts or on the sidelines or whatever, you know, and then athletes really started to get fit and, and started to take performance, physical performance more seriously. 
and the evolution of personal trainers and nutritionists and all those types of things like you talked about um, really took hold and you really started to see these ultra chisel athletes, um, you know, the time in the gym, the plyometrics and everything else. Do you think now this mental fitness uh, and, and certainly it's not so new that it, it hasn't been around for a few years, but do you think that's the next evolution in athletic and ultra performance, whether it's in the professional ranks or even for the amateur ranks, that that mental block and figuring that component out is the next big springboard forward in the evolution of the athlete? I do. I, I mean, I don't know where else you go, right? Because you have have everything else you have the technical the tactical um the body i just don't know where else you go right and yep. it's it, it, it's it's yeah i do i think it's i think we're seeing it i think we're going to see it way more um that you know the question i asked you is what we ask every single person we talk to and they say the same thing you do i mean world cup champions moms 13 year olds they all say the majority 95% of people say 70% or higher Wow. You know, and when we're talking to executive directors or college coaches or uh, pro coaches, we say, well, what are you doing to address your beliefs? Because certainly, I mean, you, you talk about the college or the professional level, you're talking about like a percentage point of difference between your competition. Like if you could get a quarter percentage point, you'd be good. Like wow. think about the payoff of that, right? And you're telling me that it's 90%. So half of me is like, I can't believe in 2022, we're just talking about this. The other half of me is like, well, as you continue to be an idiot and make the wrong decisions because you didn't realize this when you were a pro, you know what I mean? So, no, but that's what makes it so powerful. It's, it's, I, I, you know, I've, I've been there. I, I know what it's like. I know it's really, really hard. Um, and, and now I, I know what it can do for you. It can really help you. The, the things, the, the things I struggle with as a pro, I didn't leave them when I left the soccer field. I used to talk about it like I did, but I still struggle with them. I still have a, you know, and, and we tend to because of our negativity bias, but I still have this just negative dialogue on my head. Mm. You're never good enough. That's the one lie that Wells Thompson has always told himself his whole life. You're never good enough. So I'm always fighting to be good. And uh, that sometimes can rob you of, and, and you'll hear me when I talk a lot about my journey. Like if I could go back and be a pro for one more day, I'd want to sit on the bench or be in the stands. So if you're not familiar with a pro team, there's 30 guys on a team, 11 start, 18 dress. So nine are on the bench. Um, so a lot of guys don't even dress, right? Um, and, and I just wasn't able to, uh, at least as a pro, the majority of the time compete and have that hunger and still support my teammates, which robbed me mm. of a lot of fulfillment and joy because I was just so concerned about myself, my playing time, how I looked and that sort of thing. So yeah. Trying to enjoy the process. Yeah, yeah, which I would imagine would be fairly common um, in the professional ranks. There's probably a lot of people that were feeling those same emotions if they were going along the same way and they were sitting in the stands or even on the bench um, and find it hard to kind of get outside of yourself and be yeah. that ultimate teammate versus, you know, that's it's it, to some extent, it's an individual contract, it's individual performance. Like you said, you were com competing for your job each and every day. So, you know, I don't think the whole ecosystem really supports that, which Leads me to another area. So you talk a lot about, you know, the mental resilience, the mental strength, the awareness, performance anxiety, um, you know, to sum up some of the words you use, it's kind of the imposter syndrome, which I think society is becoming more and more familiar with. So yeah. 20 years ago, it was really taboo to talk about that. Um, you know, there's, there's no crying in baseball. There's, you know, you can't really show that emotional side of it, you know, just kind of grit your teeth and get after it. And, you know, but, you know, suck it up, buttercup, those types of things. So I think we're seeing a big evolution and I kind of want to pick your brain as to how this came to be. And, and really over the last three years, I think mental awareness and the stigma that has been associated with it historically is starting to erode away, thankfully. You know, I think more and more and more Americans uh, are dealing with some type of mental illness or mental well-being issue that they're not comfortable talking about publicly. And I would say, you know, it's probably still the vast majority of society are not comfortable talking about what their struggles are. You and I have had a lot of conversations about that. But really now to start to see athletes, uh, Simone Biles at the Olympics this year, Michael Phelps, uh, LeBron James, some of the others that have been very outspoken about it. Uh, Kevin Love here in Cleveland with the Cavaliers has talked a lot about it. What, what do you think made it okay to start talking about it, therefore beginning to address it, 
therefore implying more importance on your, yours and Dr. Brad's mission to bring awareness, remedy, purpose, and planning. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you it's athletes and celebrities talking about. It. I think there's a lot of power in that. People, you know, sports in our society is elevated. I think to um, uh, too much, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're heroes, really. Like the the janitor that's been working his job for thirty years, day in and day out. He's a hero in my eyes. Like yeah. I want a hero because I kicked a soccer ball. Um, but but they have a platform, and so people listen to them. So I think that helps. Uh, I think the pandemic has exacerbated it. Mm-hmm. Um, it just really limelighted the, I don't know how long, 50, 80 year upswing of depression, anxiety, suicide. I mean, you know, it's funny you talk about that because, um, you know, starting this business has been very difficult. Um, and probably nine months ago, my wife was like, you got to go see somebody. And so now I, my best friend, Andrew Marvin, growing up, uh, maybe I should have said his name, but he wouldn't care. Uh, he struggled with depression his whole life. And I was always the type of guy, like I've always been very, uh, uh, pretty optimistic and, 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 and outgoing and smiley and, and those sorts of things. And I would just tell him to think about the kids in Africa. Like mm-hmm. think about the kids that don't have water and food. And I realize now that that's actually really not what you want to tell someone that's struggling with depression because it's an imbalance. Like there's something going on up here that you can't you really understand and figure out. And they can't just be like, okay, uh, kids in Africa, I'm good now. You know what I mean? Yep. And so I've at, since had to call him and apologize. I still talk to him. He's one of my best friends, but be like, man, I'm so sorry. I wasn't better support in that. But anyway, back to my original story it was nine months ago. My wife was like, you gotta go see somebody. I was like, yeah, I do. So I went to see my doctor. I got put on um, a Zoloft and it changed my life. It really did. And I'm not saying medicine is a cure for everyone, but I was so scared when I first got put on it that people were going to be like, well, stop pushing Zoloft on me. But it literally like changed my life. I was like, man, this is amazing. And you know how jacked up I am because I was talking to my friend and I was like, hey, man, one of these pills makes me feel this way. What do you think five will do to me? You know what I mean? That's like a drug addict. That's a <laughs> yep. that's that substance abuse uh, things there. Um, but I also think, too, that... Um, you know, for, for athletes, just speaking for athletes in particular, um, there was nowhere else to go. And I hit on that earlier. There's just nowhere else to go. There's nothing else to optimize. Maybe I'm wrong there. I've been wrong before. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now in, in your talks and certainly, um, you know, dealing with some levels of depression, and anxiety, I understand and understand the discomfort that talking about it brings, right? It's just uncomfortable. I think it's still viewed as you're expressing some kind of weakness and, and, you know, everyone's fearful of that vulnerability, which is just shameful. But so in your sessions um, through your soccer resilience platform and all of your members that are part of that, you know, give us a little tidbit of kind of a breakthrough moment that you had with one of uh, the players, coaches, referees, directors, or somebody that you've dealt with that it, it was, it was so impactful to you that it solidified if it needed to be solidified that what you're doing is so purposeful and so meaningful and going to bring decades of benefit to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Now, oftentimes you don't get to see the fruit of your labor, right? Like we work with kids and um, one of the things that you hit on vulnerability, I think vulnerability is a superpower. Mm-hmm. And I think that not only is it healing for you, but people relate more to your weaknesses than to your strength, mm-hmm. strengths. As I remember when I became a pro, everyone wants you to talk, right? They're like, oh, come speak. And so my faith is really important for me at the time. And I remember just being very open and honest with my story. And, and my parents were like, you don't have to share all that. And I'm like, why would I not? Like, if it helps somebody. Like, and so it was a struggle, but I, I eventually realized like, man, I'm a jacked up individual. I got a lot of freaking issues. And so does every single person that's walking the planet of this earth, yep. right? It's silly. And so what, part of our MO a little bit is taking pro athletes, taking me and my experiences and saying, look, as the pro athlete, I struggle with this. You're not alone. And as one of the greatest philosophers in the world, Matthew McConaughey said, he said, sometimes we don't need advice. We just need to know we're not the only one. And so that's part of what we're doing. And we can tend to overcomplicate it by saying mind or mental. Like when you say mind training to me, it makes me feel funny inside. I'm like, that's weird. What do I do? Is that like taking your brain out and like cooking it up to electrodes? Like it's, it's all encompassing, right? Like your body affects your mind, your mind affects your body. Really what we're trying to give 
kids, parents, coaches is just t- tangible tools to combat the constant of life. And that's crap. That's crap and stress and struggle. So to go back to your question, Chris Denham, he's a coach in Michigan. He's 30 years old. He called me and he said, man, I'm going to invest my own money because I'm so sick and tired of watching my girls, who's a, he coaches a girls team, U13, you know, throw up in trash cans before the games, not get out of cars, have panic attacks on the field. And I'm like, first of all, like you're 30 years old and you're doing this good for you, man. Like that's mm-hmm. really, really awesome. And then it, it, the word got out within the club of our impact. And he was like, hey, can you meet with our executive director to talk about working with the whole club? I was like, absolutely. And I just kind of randomly was like, hey, how, how's it going with your team? You know, just catching up. He goes, man, you've changed our lives. You really have. Like, you know, those girls I was telling you about, they're throwing up, having panic attacks. They played all weekend without a problem. Wow. Like you're changing your lives. And so just to hear that was, was great. Right. Because you don't get to hear that often. Um, so we're, you know, our, one of our favorite quotes is Nelson Mandela said it, a sport is the greatest opportunity to change the world. And I truly believe that. And when you look at COVID schools have ramped up their resilience programs, mindfulness programs. And we're just, when, when we first started, we were like, just kind of asking clubs to, now we're challenging them. Like, guys, come on, you have to do this. More kids would rather learn this stuff in sport yep. rather than in classrooms. So I, that's so cool. And I know that that impact is going to be felt for years and years to come. And you guys are doing just such phenomenal work and certainly being the parents of two competitive kids growing up. Um, you can go through those moments, the, the anxiety before tryouts, the anxiety before a large performance, um, you know, the stress of watching someone go to the line and take a penalty kick in the shootout to try to advance the team to the next level of the tournament. I mean, and, and I, listen, I think it's for, for uh, the children that are participating in the sports, but also for the parents, they gotta, they gotta know that. I mean, I wish someone would have told me how to be a, uh, a sports parent and handle my nerves better and all the things that I got wound up about. So, you know, you guys are far reaching. I think you're adding tremendous benefit. But that's the other thing is it's changed my life. It literally has. It's changed my marriage. It's changed my relationship with my kids. I've been the crazy parent. I was chucking baseballs with my oldest son when he was six, being like, it doesn't hurt. See, it doesn't hurt. And knew what I was doing, but like, and he was crying. Like, so I've been that way. And now I'm like, I'm relaxed on the sideline. I try, I still get emotional. Right. And mm-hmm. that's, that's part of it. Like we yeah. just, we, we need to be aware of when we get those, when we get into those things. So, you know, sports parents get a bad rap, but you know, when, when my kids were born, I would just say, I don't care what they do. Just want to be happy. That's a freaking yeah. lie. Freaking lie. Everybody wants their kids to be the best athlete they can um, because it gives you so much in life. It yeah. really does. Yep. Uh, so it's a, a testimonial for me is it's, it's changed my life in every yeah. aspect. of it. That's huge. That's huge. So really what's next for you and the soccer resilience team? Um, you know, you're in, you're, you're in such a enviable position and the timing. Um, so really what's on the horizon now that you all are working on? Yeah, well, um, I think it's to meet more of my business coach, um, which is the Ryan Nelson um, you know, I've realized this whole business thing is, is difficult, right? And so being a pro athlete can be a double-edged sword in the sense that like, you know, I retired, I was 32 and I was competing against people that, you know, were just coming out of college or 23 that had five years of internships under their belts. Um, and so, um, you know, what, what we're really trying to do is just surround ourselves with really good people, um, values align people, um, you know, just have a good mindset throughout this process. And that's a big thing we try to focus on. It changed Dr. Brad Miller's uh, practice, a great book, Carol Dweck, uh, called Mindset. Um, but it's just believing that you can always get better. You can always improve. Um, and so, yeah, it's for us. Um, we see so much opportunity. It's, it, it's just... Um, you know, uh, it's, it's freaking one day at a time, right? It's yeah. one day at a time, you know, it's, it's continuing to change lives and, and use our stories and use our networks to, um, do what Nelson Mandela said, change yeah. the world. Man. Yeah. Change that's world. really cool. Well, and I know you guys will accomplish that. There's no doubt, no doubt in, in my mind at all. So Wells this has been amazing. I'm going to get through our uh, fast five here. Um, which are a little bit more off script, less about the business. I do want to have you back and, and talk um, maybe as we get closer to the world cup kicking off is kind of talk about the growth of the game in the States. Um, Since you've been so involved in it because 
Um, I'm not as involved in, in following the game as I once was when, when Buddy was playing and certainly you were playing, but the growth has just exploded. I mean, the MLS teams that have come onto the scene, the stadiums that they're building, the capacity crowds, and I really want to kind of pick your brain about, you know, where you're at with that and, and the excitement level that you have for it. So, um, but before we go, um, so you, you had an opportunity, again, we talked a lot about your professional time, um, to travel the country in, in certain parts of the world. So what was your favorite playing experience and or stadium to play in? The, the one that's really the most memorable that you kind of, you still look back and say, I got to pinch myself that I was in this moment at this time. Seattle, no doubt. Okay. Um, I don't know how many ever thousand, 60, 70,000 people. It was a different experience is kind of out of body. You can't hear anything. It's just a completely different energy. So contrasting that with the revolution with which gets 10,000 fans and they're in the same football stadium, Seattle is just amazing. If you're ever in Seattle and you have an opportunity to go see a game, doesn't matter where, where the seats are. It's absolutely phenomenal. Just go and be a part of it. Great advice. Yeah. So certainly, um, you know, the MLS, I, I think it's transitioned, but it was kind of a, you know, the, um, the, the league where the David Beckhams came and some players came back to play in the MLS. Uh, Terry Henry was certainly one of them and some of the other more prominent player towards the end of yeah. their time playing over in Europe, they came back. Um, so in your opinion, who was, who was the most feared opponent or teammate that you played alongside or against? Um, God, it's a great question. Um, I, Landon Donovan's one that comes, comes to mind. Um, Thierry Henry was massive. I mean, he, I have a picture of him. He's like 12 feet tall and he has his hand on my head. And I mean, they have a statue of, outside of Arsenal of Thierry Henry. Like he's one of the greatest players to play the game. Um, Jeff Lorenowitz. So I spent my whole career with Jeff Lorenowitz, another underdog guy had probably one of the most, um, maybe fourth in the league overall ever in minutes. Wow. Um, just a hard worker. He was always the unsung sunk hero. So he's one guy that always comes to mind as well. Yeah. Very cool. And then on kind of a similar note, most admired uh, somebody that you just, whether they were a teammate or opponent opponent that you just admired how they approached it with their workmanship, their craft, their professionalism, um, their yeah. attitude, mentality, and so forth. Uh, Jeff Lorenowitz, he, okay. he would be in my, uh, what is it called? Uh, when you're in like a, a hole, like you're in war. Oh, in a, in a foxhole? He'd be in your foxhole? Yeah, he'd be in a foxhole group, whatever you yep. call it, foxhole five or whatever. Uh, Jeff Lorenowitz, I mean, he's never took a day off. Actually, we didn't get along great as teammates, but uh, man, just respect the heck out of him. Landon Donovan. I do respect Landon Donovan. I remember one time, it was probably 2012 after a game, I went up to him and said, hey, man, thank you for everything you've done for U.S. soccer. He's had the weight of U.S. soccer on his shoulder for years and years. And I just remember his expression during that. Like He was like, thank you. Um, and so those two. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. So um, you did mention it just briefly, and we didn't get a lot of time to unpack it, but you did get into ultra running. I'm going to take a little bit of credit for that since I did get you into the tough mutters yes. and uh, kind of you do. that bug on. And I, I, I remember right after those uh, 11 or 12 miles that we did during that tough mutter, you were just ready to go. You were like, okay, when can we do the next one? When can we do the next one? So yeah. um, explain just briefly what an ultra runner is and then get into a little bit about the longest distance that you've run in a continuous format. Yeah, it's anyone, it's an ultra run is anything longer than a marathon, uh, and usually on trails in the mountains. Um, so they start out like 50k, which is like 32 miles, 50 miles, uh, 100k, which is like 63, and then 100 miles. Uh, I completed 100 miles during COVID. So I ran uh, 100 miles in 24 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, continuously, it was a four mile loop around a lake. So I ran it 25 times. It was miserable, absolutely oh miserable. Someone quit 12,000 times. Um, but it, it, to me, it's, uh, it's the power of the mind. We can do so much and our brains, uh, just sabotage us yep. a lot of time. Right. Um, so that's the farthest I've run is hundred miles. I'm super proud of it. We dug that's two clean water wells in East Africa as a result of that. So that was wow. the cool part of it. Yeah, super cool. Um, okay, so you have you have two nicknames, 
and they are on the total opposite ends of the spectrum. So, um, you know, you proudly introduced to the world that you were known affectionately as sunshine because of your positive demeanor, your bright smile. But in the league and through playing career, you had a different nickname, which was El Diablo. So, uh, um, you know, on one end, you're El Diablo. On the other end, you're sunshine. Which one do you prefer and which one do you most associate yourself with? Uh, I definitely have both of them in me. Uh, definitely sunshine. El Diablo was, I, I was known to get some cards, uh, in games. My emotions just took over. I got this in Chicago. I got three red cards in a row. I've never heard of anyone else doing that. No, it's pretty impressive. Um, so needless to say they, that, that nickname stuck. Um, my dad just told me to reframe it. It's like King David. My faith is important to me. So, you know, God wants us to be the hardest working, uh, most aggressive, most passionate person on the field. And I certainly was that. I towed the line at all times. And um, I re it was really an asset for me that I didn't truly know how to control. And um, I wish I did. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're both great nicknames. Both great nicknames. <laughs> so um, now one that touches on what you're doing with Soccer Resilience. And I do hope some people go to SoccerResilience.com and check out your website, your story, what uh, you're offering. There's going to be so many people that listen that have kids in youth soccer because so many kids play it. Um, and I think it's, it's well worth the journey over there. So what's the best or your favorite professional memory that you share um, with young players now, whether it's a live public speaking event over a Zoom call or through the Soccer Resilience platform that you know just resonates with them, that, that it connects and it makes that immediate impactful difference in their personal journey. You don't even associate with sports, but their own life journey. Yeah, I think it's sharing just my, my negativity, my thoughts, um, how I um, just... Uh, at, uh, performance identity how a lot of times my identity would just hindered on my performance if I played well it was good if I didn't play well it was bad I'll tell you one thing on the positive side is um, playing a different position so having a growth mindset when I went to college uh, they moved me positionally and I hated it and I said I can't play outside mid for two years and I made one decision heading into my junior year that changed the trajectory of my life and career. I believe it's actually the reason I got drafted. Wow. All I did was accept being an outside midfielder. And so just attributing that to having a growth mindset and, and, and the fact that like you can't control what happens to your life, but you can always control how you respond. And so part of me is very thankful that for two years I was able to, to respond the right way. Uh, I, the other part is I wish I would have responded earlier uh, and made the best of, of, what the coaches were allowing me to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. Great story. I bet that does really uh, hits home with a lot of people as they're going around and their coaches are trying to move around the field and just take on different, you know, different challenges in life and try something different. So kind of that growth mindset, like you said, so Wells, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, every, I never get tired of hearing your story. You tell it with uh, such passion and such energy and, um, your confidence over the years of sharing it has just grown and it's so enjoyable yeah. for me to sit and watch your journey from professional athlete to where you are to dad, husband, entrepreneur, CEO, everything else that you have going on. Very proud of you, excited um, for what you and everybody has going on. And I'm anxious to have you back on the podcast if, if you'll allow us the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm so glad that I remember this because oftentimes when I tell my story, it makes it seem like I did it. I didn't. Like I think back to the, the my parents, my family, all the amazing coaches in my life, amazing teammates, uh, great cheerleaders and mentors like you. Um, like I, I, there's no such thing as a self-made man. I am a product of the people in my life and I wouldn't be nowhere near where I am today if I didn't have great people like you in my life. So That's thank awesome. you. I'm not from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Wells. We really enjoyed it and look forward to having you back on again. Thanks, brother. Appreciate thank it. You. See ya.